You look at modern cities with electrical, water, transportation networks, they have this incredibly high built-in power demand, and they are built and maintained with these highly specialized, complex materials and expertise. So in any future where energy is not as abundant as it is today, it's going to become increasingly difficult and finally maybe impossible to keep modern cities functioning. So imagine like a cattle feedlot, right? You, you see pictures of these things with animals really tightly packed together. And Bill Reese, urban studies pro professional, co-developer of ecological footprint, he calls cities feedlots for people. And, you know, that sounds a little harsh, but uh, he's, he's talking about this in sort of the structural way. Like, you know, in a cattle feedlot, water is piped in, feed is trucked in and delivered to feed troughs. The waste has to be picked up and moved off mechanically as well. And without the cheap energy we have, especially diesel, this would all be ridiculous and no one would do it. So we have created this ab absurd food system, especially I'm talking about in so-called developed world, and it's an energy disaster. And people have in mind big tractors when they think about energy in, in food, but so much of it actually happens afterwards with the processing and packaging. But all that is the requirement to get it into these cities. So it stores and fits on trucks and, and in warehouses, et cetera. So this modern supermarket system really just can't continue. When we think about transitioning agriculture, we have this imagination that we're talking about farming techniques, types of agriculture, labor distribution. And the thing that I think about when I imagine this transition from industrial agriculture to a more subsistence-based small farm, small community, family agriculture, a lot of places I've been around the world where the population distribution is still spread across the land in a way where you have the people that are distributed around to actually do the work versus the U.S., where, I mean, I know where we live in the Willamette Valley here, I think the average grass seed farmer farms about 1,400 acres. So we don't have the development pattern. We don't have the distribution of people across the landscape. We don't have the transportation network that's conducive to this transition to a lower energy footprint. So if you're going to transition, say, the United States, for instance, you're not just talking about an agricultural transition. You're talking about a demographic transition, a development transition. I just came back from Senegal about two weeks ago, and I was in some really remote village areas. So I was touring these different food forest sites, and the people were moving between these villages primarily through little tracks using donkey carts. I mean, that was the main mode of transportation. So when you think about relocalizing and shrinking farms and agriculture, you're also shrinking transportation networks, you're shrinking commutes, you're shrinking the distance that people travels, and you're building a new type of development pattern that is scaled to small-scale agriculture. The fossil fuel agriculture, the fossil chemical agriculture, is the reason we have monocultures. When you allow nature to work, symbiosis allows different plants to work together. But when you put an external input of fossil fuels, then just one variety, one species can go. And we've been misled by a very false indicator which I realized when I was studying the Green Revolution in 1984. The indicator is called yield per acre, but yield merely measures the commodity that leaves the land. It does not measure the state of the land. It does not measure the state of the farmer. It doesn't measure the fossil fuel inputs and the energy inputs. It does not measure the quality of the food you're eating. So when we talk about feeding the 8 billion, we need to talk about food, not the nutritionally empty commodities that are being traded. Because chemicals don't feed the plant, it's the symbiosis between the soil organisms and the mycorrhizal fungi which feeds the plant and the plant feeds the fungi. And that's how the constant sustenance of life carries on. When you intensify biodiversity rather than chemicals, you actually increase nutrition per acre. And what matters in food is not the weight, what matters in food is the nourishment and the nutrition. So we could feed two times the world population by shrinking the acreage, but intensifying the biodiversity. 
and further intensifying the nutrition in that biodiversity, which is what happens both when you use biodiversity itself and diversity of native seeds, which were bred for nourishment, as well as encouraging the soil to feed the plant. My parents, they were born 1937 in a very small community called Raymond, Minnesota. And when they, when they were brought up in the 40s and early, even in the early 50s, before cheap refrigerated transport came along, on Friday nights, all of the farmers from all around the area would bring all of their produce that couldn't be transported. So like you've got cream, you've got milk, you've got eggs, you've got all kinds of stuff coming into town. They would sell all of their produce to cooperatively owned buying groups that would distribute this produce back to the people in the town. And they might actually go have a drink, they might go to a dance, and they, then they would go home. The peasant culture, in, even in the America, isn't that far gone. It's two generations removed. So do I think that we could do it again? Absolutely. I've been growing with my wife, Stephanie. We've been growing 85% of our own calories on our farm, our 117-acre farm here in central Minnesota for the past six to seven years. And every year, because we are planting perennial systems, every year, our workload gets less and our productive capacity of the land goes up. Our carbon and our soil organic matter goes up. All of the indicators of health and the ecology and of the animals and the people go up every single year. So do I think that we could do this? Absolutely. The question is, will we do it in a way that is reactive or proactive? Because if we make this transition in a proactive way, we can do all this no problem. If we do it in a reactive way, probably not, because there's going to have to be such a demographic shift from the cities to the rural areas to be able to capture low density energy flows across the landscape that we would end up spending so much of our time just trying to rebuild infrastructure to make that happen that I don't know if we would actually make that happen in a timely manner. So... The answer, yes, is, is absolutely no doubt about it if we do it in a proactive way.